Open up your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 13, and the name of my message today is Plow the Ground You've Been Given. Amen? Plow the Ground You've Been Given. See, all of us want something that's not been given to us. Amen? All of us, we want something that seems like it's been given to somebody else, but we all, it seems like we all want something that's not been given to us instead of being faithful with what's been given to us. Amen? You talk, you, you talk to people that are called the ministry. They always want to do more and more and more. They want to preach to the nations, but they ain't preached in the city they live in. They want to, lay, they, they want to travel and do all of that stuff, but they hadn't walked across the street to share the gospel with their neighbor. They want to go and do more and more and more, but they ain't shared, they ain't shared the gospel with the ones that, that, that they work with. They ain't shared the gospel with their friends with. They ain't, they ain't shared the gospel with so many people, yet they want more. They want what somebody else has, but they don't want to work in the very area that they've been given. That makes sense? So that's why the name of this message today is Plow the Ground that You've Been Given. You are to work, you are to plant, and you are to grow right where you're at. And then as God starts expanding your territory, then you step out. Amen? So when we look at this, Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 23 tells us, it says, much food is the tillage of the poor, but there is that that is destroyed for want of judgment. Let me read it to you out of the Amplified. Abundant food is the fallow, uncultivated ground of the poor, but without protection it is swept away by injustice. So much food is the tillage. That means uncultivated ground. And I want you to think about somebody, and the Lord very possibly here is talking about somebody that may not be blessed, may not have the ability every time that they want to go get something to eat, to go out to eat, go through a drive through go do something like that. Amen? You may, not, you may not have that ability. A person may not have that ability to be able to go down to the store and do this. But what he is saying is he's saying, you work what's been given to you. You be faithful with what's been given to you. Yeah, you may sit back and you may look at what somebody else has got. You may sit back and you may look and somebody else may be eating this and eating that and going to this restaurant and going to that restaurant, traveling here and traveling there. But what he's saying, he's saying, you work the ground that's been given to you. And you be thankful and you work the ground that's been given to you. Because until you can be thankful and work what's been given to you, you're never going to progress outside of that. Amen? So when you think about this, when I was looking at it, and I've been looking at it for the past couple of days, and I've just been meditating on it, much food uh, is the tillage, is the uncultivated ground of the poor. In other words, it may be the poor, the poor person. You think about somebody that doesn't have a lot of money, but they got some land. It's that person right there. They don't have the ability maybe to go down to the market and buy food. They don't have the ability to have their food delivered. They don't have the ability to go out to a restaurant and eat. They may not have the ability to do some of these things, but they do got a plot of land. Amen? Instead of sitting back wishing they could go doing what somebody else has the ability to do, he's telling them, this is what you're to do. Work the land that you've been given. Break the ground that you've been given. Work in the place that I have put you right now. Amen? And there's many of us that we're wanting to move on and we're not wanting to work where God's got us right now. We're not wanting to work the land that God's given us right now. Many of us are wanting to go into nations, but we're not willing to minister where we work right now. Many of us are wanting to do this, but we're not willing to be faithful where we're at right now. Many of us are wanting to go do more, but we're not willing to be obedient where we are right now. Amen? And we always want more, and we want more. And the way that we show our faithfulness is by being obedient in what we've been given thus far. Amen? Does that make sense to everybody? So when we look at this, he says, much food is the tillage of the poor, and lack of justice there is weight. In other words, what they have worked for is taken away. So he's got twofold here. We've got, a, we've got a job to do. Number one, we are to help to protect people that take advantage of the poor. All right? Does that make sense? All right? Does that make sense? That don't mean just going out what Brother Chris was reading a while ago. When Brother Chris was get, uh, reading out and he was talking about it, I was looking, uh, looking up one of the words that he said, and one of the meetings of that was, People that deserve to receive it are people that, uh, that in other words, that, that, that when you were helping people, one of the, one of the uh, things that had to happen was they had to be deserving of what you was given to them. Does that make sense? All right, so now let me, let me break this down. These are some notes that I made. Much food is the tillage of the poor. Lack of justice there is weight. The poor man doesn't have money to go to the store and get the finest of food, so it's very important that his garden be taken care of so he and his family can eat. All right? 
The poor man may not have the ability to go and buy all the fancy stuff, all the fancy foods, go out to the fancy restaurants and do all that stuff, but it's very, very important that he take care of the ground, that he take care of the garden, that he take care of what he's planted. Why? It is very, very important that he take care of that. Why? Because if he does not take care of that, then his family does not eat. He does not have the ability to go out and let somebody else cook it. He does not have the ability to go out and let somebody else prepare it. He does not have the ability to go out and hire somebody else to do it. It is very, very important. He knows if he's not out there doing what he needs to do, that his family will starve. And he's got a job to do. And that job means that he's got to go out and he's got to do the break, uh, uh, back-breaking work of breaking the ground up. He's got to get out there with a, with a plow. He's got to get out there with a disc. He's got to break the ground up. And then the first time he breaks the ground up, then there's going to be big clods of dirt. And then you hook up a disc to the, to the uh, tractor, or you hook it up, whatever it does, and then it breaks those clods down smaller. So when you plow the ground, the plow, the ground will be turned over to expose that which is underneath. When you plow ground, you drop the plow, and you watch that plow will turn it over. It'll plow deep, and it'll start exposing the roots that are underneath. It'll start taking the roots of the weeds and all that stuff, and it'll flip it up. Why? Because when you flip those roots up, the sun hits it and kills it. See, that's what the Word of God does in my life and your life. It gets down on the inside of us, and it exposes those hidden things so that the Word of God can go to work and uproot those things that are hidden that we don't want nobody else to know about. And then what ends up has to happen is he's got to take a disc and he puts it on that and then he starts breaking it down into smaller parts. And that's what the Word of God does in my life and your life. That he, handles, he gets the big stuff first, but it's a continual work in our life that he's always breaking things down in our life, always doing a work in our life. And then after all that's broke down, he's got to go along and he's got to get all the rocks out of it. Why does he got to get the rocks out of it? Because the rocks stunt the growth of the roots. Is the rocks that are just right under the surface, what will happen is the roots will go down, hit the rock, and on the top side, listen to me, church, listen to me, church, this is where a majority of the church is. This is why there's so much compromise. This is why there's so much weakness. This is why there's so much giving in and adversity because you've not got the rocks. You've not got the very things living right under the soil out of your life. And when the seed of the Word of God is planted and the roots go down, because everybody knows that a tree, when a tree grows, that the roots are as big as the top of the tree. If the top of the tree has got a shade this big right here, then the root system is roughly the same size. Why? Because something smaller can't hold up something that's bigger. All right? So what happens is, if you don't get the rocks out of the ground, then what happens is, is when you put the seed that the tap root, the first root goes down, and what ends up happening, that the roots will not get as deep as they need to get on many, many plants, even though on the top side, it looks like it's beautiful. See, on the top side, it'll look like it's growing. On the top side, it'll have all kinds of growth. But when the sun comes out and when a little bit of drought hits, why? It's burned up. Why? Because it's not rooted deep enough in the ground. And that's why so many of us, we walk around bumping our lips and saying all these cool things, and we know all these little cliches to say, and we want to do all this work for Jesus, and we want to do all this stuff, and we got a bunch of scriptures memorized, and we know how to say a bunch of stuff, but the first time a little bit of adversity comes our way, we fold up like a $4 lawn chair and we cave in. Why? Because our root is not deep, even though everybody else thinks something beautiful going on. And so when a little bit of sin, when a little bit of adversity, when a little bit of desire comes in, we do not have the strength to resist it. Why? Because we're not near as spiritually grounded as we give ourselves credit for. Amen? So this is what this man does. He's got to cultivate his ground. He's got to get it ready. He's got to get the rocks out. And then he's got to put the seed in. And then what does he got to do? He's got to cover the seed. Why does he got to cover the seed so the foul of the air doesn't come and steal it? That's why the Bible tells us very, very clearly. It says that immediately what happens, Satan comes to do what? He comes to steal the word. So if you're out there, if you're working in a garden, if you ever worked in a garden, all right, and you put the seed in the ground, you got to cover it up. Why? Because squirrels, birds, everything else going to be coming out there trying to steal the seed that you just throwed in the ground. And what's going to end up happening? The seed that you just throw, you're going to be looking out there two or three weeks later, you go, why ain't anything coming up yet? Because you didn't guard your heart. You didn't guard your seed. You didn't guard your heart. The Bible says that we are to guard our heart. Amen. That means that when the Word of God comes into my heart, when something's going on in my heart, when the Word of God comes into my heart, I am to guard my heart. I'm not to allow the enemy to come and steal the seed out of my heart. I got to guard it. What does it mean to guard it? That I don't need to be around people that are speaking contrary to what God's wanting to do in my life. 
I don't need to be around people that are trying to pat me on the back and tell me what I'm doing is okay. I don't need to be around people that are trying to pat me on the back telling me everything's going to be all right. I don't need to be around people that are not going to speak the truth of the Word of God to me in love. And we think the truth of the Word of God is denying what's going on. That's how we guard our heart. We guard our heart by not allowing things contrary to the Word to be comfortable in our lives. Does that make sense? So what does he do? He covers it up. It's hidden deep in the ground. And he covers it up. And then what does he got to do? He's got to water it. He's got to water it. Why does he got to water it? Because the seed that's in the ground must be watered. And that's what we do when we get into the Word of God and when we study the Word of God. See, there's some of you that get out of here today, you need to go, you need to go water this Word. You need to go take this Word, and then you need to study it out, and you need to water it and let it grow in your life. That's what it means to, to, to water. See, you got, you, many of us are trying to water something that may not be there. Or it's something that's there, we're wondering why it's not growing. It's because we're not putting any water on it. So the Word of God, how do, we, how, do we water the, how do we water the Word of God in our life? That when the, when the Spirit of God moves into my life, when the Spirit of God moves into your life, then the watering of the Word is the study of the Word, the prayer of the Word, the fellowship, and the communion with God. That's where your growth comes from. And then through the uh, reading of the Word, the study of the Word, prayer, and communion with God, that keeps the enemy from coming and stealing the Word of God, and that causes growth in our life. But many of us, our, our relationship with God is nothing more than going to church. And we spend no time throughout the week watering the Word of God, studying the Word of God. And then when you water the Word of God, study the Word of God, then you've got to carry out the most important part of that, and that's being actually obedient to the Word of God. And it's under the obedience that growth comes. So, so many of us today, when we look into the Word of God, we're not studying the Word of God. We're not spending time in prayer. We're not spending time seeking the face of God. And then our relationship with God becomes boring. Why? Because there's no growth. Because there's no growth. And how can you tell when there's no relationship with God? This is how you can tell when there's not a relationship with God. Because your walk with God is scattered with compromise rather than consistency of following God. I believe that. You can, you can bump your lips all day long. You can bump your lips all day long. And then you got the people that have no relationship with God. They have no, they have no conflict either one going on. They, don't ever, they ain't ever going to upset anybody. They ain't ever going to say nothing to anybody. Why? Because they ain't got enough boldness in the Holy Ghost to say anything. That's one thing. Then you got the other group of people that they think they got boldness in the Holy Ghost and they talk all the time. But there's no anointing on it whatsoever and it's just dead words coming out of their mouth. Amen. And then you got some people that study the Word of God, but follow the Word of God, obey the Word of God, and people don't like them either. <laughs> so, hey, you choose your medicine. <laughs> All right, let's go over here. <clears throat> In our own life, we must protect the seed, and, and I went through that. So, my food, much food is the tillage. You and I got to work. This is our ground right here. This is our ground. And you're only going to get out of this what you put in it. Much food. We ought to get into this. We ought to dig in this. We ought to plow in this. We ought to water our life with this. And we ought to obey this. This is the ground that we've been given. Amen. And then also, so talking about the ground that you've been given, is when we talk about that, this farmer here, he works his own ground. He don't go around working in other people's fields. He may go help them out. But he works his own ground. And you and I all, we've, been, we've all been, what are you doing with the ground that you've been given? What are you doing with the place that you've been given? What are you doing with the family that you've been given? What have you been doing with the wife and the children that you've been given? Are you, are you leading them in Bible study? Are you leading them in the Word of God? Are you plowing the ground that you've been given? Are you teaching them about the things of God? Are you? 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 Are you, sitting down with your, are you sitting down and getting into the Word of God yourself? Are you teaching them these things? Are you being faithful with the ground that you've been given? Are you being faithful in raising up your children in the ways of God? Are you being faithful with the ground that you've been given? Are you being faithful with these things? Are you sitting down and going through and studying the Word of God? Are you being faithful? Are you studying the Word of God so that when the kids come to you and ask you something, that it ain't go ask your mama or go ask your daddy, but you got an answer to give them? Why? Because you've been plowing your field. When somebody comes to you at work, do you got a word or you just got some bumbling, bumbling stuff that flows off your lips? It's a bunch of humanism that ain't got nothing to do with the Word of God. What are you doing with the ground that you've been given? What are you doing with the people at your job that God has placed you right there on that job? 
And half the people on your job don't even know that you're a Christian. Or even worse than that, that the people on your job know that you go to church, but because you got such a compromise in your life, they have absolutely no problem talking to you as if you didn't even live for God. Amen? That, yeah, you go to church, but there's such a compromise in your life. Your, your walk is so weak. That you do nothing to go to church, but there's no character outside of you saying you go to church of a Christian mark on your life whatsoever. To where they just feel like they can walk up to you and say whatever they want to say to you. Because there's never been any evidence of Christ in your life in front of that person. How you doing with the ground you've been given? Does that make sense? How you doing with the ground you've been given? Let's look at this. Our job is to speak the truth in love. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 14. Does this make sense to everybody? Our job, let's go to Ephesians 4, or I'm sorry, Ephesians 4, 14. Ephesians 4, 14. Let's look at it. I'm going to read this to you. That we henceforth, he's saying now, now that we no more, listen to this, be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind and wave of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Now check this out. That we henceforth be no more tossed, no more children tossed to and fro. No more get tossed to and fro by all this stuff, by all these goofy doctrines, by all these goofy ideas, these goofy opinions. He says, quit being like kids that's getting tossed backwards and forth over things about the Word of God when people actually, what they're doing is they're coming in and the only thing they got at heart is their own desires. Let me read it to you here. Listen. It says, so that we are no longer children, spiritually immature, that we henceforth be no more children, that spiritually immature, not understanding the ways of God and the consequences. See, a child that continues doing wrong, the only way that they learn the proper way of doing right is they understand that consequences are going to have to be paid. But so many times we live in a society today to where there's no consequences for sin, but sin is rewarded. Amen? We live in a society today to where there's no consequences, so if you're in a church to where there's consequences for your actions, you just go bounce out and find a church where there is no consequences, like a child spiritually immature being tossed to and fro. Does that make sense? We don't want a place that's going to hold me accountable for my actions. I want a place that's going to allow me to do what it is that I want to do with absolutely no, uh, no accountability for the way that I live according to the Word of God at all. Amen? And the moment, and this is what the Word of God is talking about when he gets to speaking the truth in love. He's saying right here, he's saying, don't be like a child that's being tossed to and fro, being deceived being led astray. When are you going to get to the place? When are we going to get to the place to where we are not deceived by stuff that just sounds good? When are we going to get to the place to where we've got the gift of discernment working in our lives so much that just because somebody stands up and they say something and they're charismatic and they say it kind and they got a gift to speak, when are we going to get discern when are we going to get discerning enough to where we can identify it and not move for any other reason but for what the word of God teaches us? So he says, he says, don't be. He says, he says, let he says that we henceforth be no more children, spiritually immature not understanding the ways of God and the consequences, tossed to and fro. That means like a boat or a ship on a stormy sea, always up and down. Do you know why people's lives that, that are so-called Christians, you know why it's always up, always down? How you doing today? Not good. How you doing today? Wonderful. How you doing today? Not good. How you doing today? Wonderful. The Bible calls that childish. Now, this is when you're going to find out if you really believe the Word of God or not. And this is what he's saying not to be like. Tall, 
tossed to and fro. That's like a ship that's out there on a stormy sea. And you know why a ship is on a stormy sea? Because the sea is not calm. There's all kinds of turmoil going on around it that causes the sea to get stormy. And when you and I are not rooted and grounded in the Word of God and we're making decisions that are not based upon the Word of God, then life around us becomes stormy. It becomes very unstable. And we're up and we're down and we're up and we're down and we're up and we're down. And we wonder what is going on. We're up and down not being obedient to the Word of God. Up and down not obeying God. And he says that's childish. And carried about with every wind of doctrine, continually shifting up and down, side to side, no stability. All right, let me tell you all something. If the Word of God says, do not be unequally yoked, and you're unequally yoked, you're in a different doctrine than I am. <laughs> that makes sense, John? Now, you can sit there and say all day you're not. But if the Word of God sits there and tells you that there's people you ought not be around and you're being around the people that the Bible says you ought not be around and you're in a different doctrine than I am. If the Bible tells us that we're to carry ourselves, put off the old man, put on the new, and we're not putting off and putting on, then that's a different doctrine than, than what I'm reading. If the Bible tell, told the Israelites, don't be with the Canaanites, don't be with the Amorites. Don't be. And they're going out there and they're being with them. That's a different doctrine. So what happens is our will and our desire dictates the doctrine that we want to follow instead of the Holy Spirit. Our will, our desire, my wants, and the lust of my stinking flesh dictates the doctrine that I want to follow instead of the Holy Spirit. And when the lust... And the flesh is strong enough, then that becomes what I follow. And I say I'm following God. It's a different doctrine. And I wonder why we're up, why we're down, why we're up. Have you ever seen people? I mean, just every day. I mean, all the time. Just live a life of misery because it's, their, their compromise is so continual, their, their doctrine is so in, unstable that makes sense? Yeah. Right, let's go on here. <laughs> Y'all with me? And it said, by every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie and wait to deceive. That means willing to do anything or say anything that profits them. And you know who the biggest preacher is that we listen to that profits me? That's me, self. I will tell myself, I will justify things, I will come up with things, I will lie to me all day long in order to please me. You ain't got to go find a preacher that'll do it. We do a wonderful job to ourselves. Come up with cunningness and come up with these schemes and come up with this and come up with that. And then if we find a preacher that's in agreement with that, then out of the two witnesses let it be established. Don't be looking for a preacher that comes into agreement with the lust of your flesh. Be looking for a preacher that when he preaches the gospel, it pierces your flesh. It should break you. This is what Jesus is saying, or Paul is saying, don't be like unstable. And these are things we look over, man. I, I sometimes people, Kevin, can I preach? No, why? You're too unstable. Whoa. Man, one day you're up here, next day you're down here. One day you're doing this, next day you said you quit, and you're over here doing it again and lying about it. What? But I want to preach. I know you want to preach. You just don't want to live like you preach. You want all the pats on the back and the accolades that come from being, believe me, that's what I wanted once before also until I started preaching. There's a lot more bad talk about you and a lot more stabs in the back than there is accolades. 
And if your character ain't ready to deal with it, you ain't going to be able to handle it. It'll crush you. There is more people, when you're standing up and you're preaching the Word of God, more people are going to talk about you, more people are going to dig on you, more people are going to talk about you behind you, behind your back, more people are going to look for reasons. So if your character is not built up by the Spirit of God to deal with that, it's going to crush you. Believe me, being a true minister of the gospel is not going to win a popularity contest. All right, now this is what he said. Now let me read this in, in back to back. He says that we henceforth be no more tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lay in wait to deceive. He says this, but speaking. Now when he says but speaking, this directly correlates it to the previous verse, right? And so when he says but speaking, he's saying do this instead. He said, don't listen to this mess with people coming up to you and trying to tell you this mess. Don't listen to that. Every wind and wave of doctrine trying to get you on stubble. He said, but speaking. He didn't say just living it out like people say today. Well, I, I, I don't preach the gospel. I'd rather just live it out. He said, speak it out. He says, but speaking. What? But speaking. The truth in love. In all things. This is what, it's, this is what that means. In all things. In our speech and the way we live. It says, but speaking the truth in love. See, here's the deal. There is no need for speaking truth if there's not something coming against the truth in this scenario right here. Does that make sense? So what is he talking about? He's talking about people that are tossed to and fro, unstable, every wind and wave of doctrine, okay? And he's talking about men that are doing this. Why? For their own what? Advantage. Okay, and then he comes up and says, but speaking truth. So in other words, there's got to be something spoke that's opposing that. You see that, Ronnie? In other words, take the, look at this, look at this. Look at, put 14 back up there for me real quick. So we can all see it together. That we henceforth be no more children tossed back and forth, all right? He's telling us not to be like children, not to be tossed backwards and forth, all right? And carried about by every wind and wave, everything that just sounds good, that's pleasing to you, all right? By every wind and by the slight, by the cunningness, by the craftiness, whereby they lay in wait to deceive. That these people that are not willing to speak the truth of the Word of God, this is them. They're cunning, they're crafty, they deceive. But now the direct, what's the word I'm looking for? Antibiotic for this, the medicine for this, the pill for this is the gospel, the antidote for this. Now put the next one up there. The antidote is this, but speaking the truth. And we do not understand nowadays that if the truth is spoken and if it hurts your feelings, we think that's not love. So when something is said, and if we don't like it, if it goes against my desires, my wants, my getting tossed to and fro, if it hurts my feelings, then I think that's not love. Or if I say it in a tone of voice like I got, he's not saying it in love. And really, you just got to go ahead and you just got to go ahead and amputate that. Also, you got to dig that on out. Cause let me tell you something, I ain't no dummy. All right. I spoke, I, I, listen, it's like I tell guys in the men's home. You got something to do? They work, they gripe about working too much. You get new people in the home. Oh, all they trying to do is make money off us. They work. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Lord. All they trying to do is make money off us. I your What are y'all laughing at? Y'all supposed to be praying for me, not laughing at me. 
So, but you bring him into the men's home, you bring him into the women's home, not so much. Now, check this out. Like we have God in the uh, men's home. We'll run them off quick. Get out of here. They start coming in and saying, the only thing they're trying to do is get us out here and work so they can make money off us. So you gripe about working. Then you let them sit around here two days and they don't do nothing, and they gripe about not having nothing to do. Listen, with people that are tossed to and fro, up and down, it don't matter what you're going to do. It don't matter what. It don't matter what. They are miserable people. Why? Because they don't have their doctrine foundation. Their life's on the sand rather than on the rock. Miserable people. Amen? So you can sit there. There's people I talk to. I can talk to them softly. They get mad. I talk to them loudly. They get mad. It don't matter when you tell the word of God. It don't matter how I say. If I, it don't matter how I say you ain't seeing your wife this week. I can say that softly or I can say that loudly. You're going to get mad. Yeah. <laughs> right? That's it. So it don't matter. And guess what? I'm still going to win. Why is that? Because we're going to do what the word and what the rules say, right? Does that make sense? All right? So when we look at that, when we look at these things, when we look into the Word of God, all right, we got to learn. We got to learn right here. And, and when I say win, I'm not saying because I'm going to win, but the, the Word of God is going to prevail. That's what we're going to stand on. Does that make sense? All right? But speaking the truth, now listen, in love may grow up into him in all things. Why is it so important for us to speak the truth in love? The reason that we speak the truth in love and the purpose of it is that that person may grow up. That that person may mature. Because if I don't speak the truth, then how am I going to combat the doctrine that snuck in that's going up and down like this? If I don't speak the truth, how am I going to speak to the instability? How am I going to speak to the compromise? How am I going to speak to the giving in? If we don't speak the truth, how are we going to grow that person up and see the spiritually mature? How? And so to the person that doesn't want to grow, they get angry, they get mad, they bellyache, they whine, they complain, they murmur. And what they'll do is they'll go around finding somebody like this right here and they'll start talking to you because they're trying to draw you. Let me read to you what tries to happen there. All right? <laughs> That's right. That's right. And it says that you henceforth, see, don't be as childish as they are by listening to it. I mean, church, come on today. Today we got too many, we got too many man boys. What is a man boy? That's a man in his size, but he still acts like a boy on the inside. Ain't got no understanding, ain't got no wisdom. I mean, really, I mean, you look at it, there's, there's, there's no difference many times between full-grown and full-grown full grown men and women that when you confront them with the Word of God, that they're no different than a two-year-old child that has a walleye fit in Walmart aisle because they're not getting a piece of candy. They want to quit. They want to give up. They want to get mad. They want to scream. They want to yell. They want to do all this stuff. So what's their next step? Don't be like children tossed to and fro and carried away by every wind of doctrine. By the slight of men, listen, by the cunningness and craftiness of men, they're trying to deceive you. I'll tell you all this. I say this a lot to people. You know, many of us will not even be in a relationship unless we see the benefit for us. Let me tell you, what, let me tell you how, how things work. See, a lot of people, me and my wife, we say this quite a bit, but we don't have like, a whole lot of friends that we hang out with regularly. I mean, I'll be honest. I mean, ain't a whole lot of gatherings. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not saying that. So, I mean, I'm not saying that to be mean. I'm not saying that in no way. Just things we don't do. You know. So a lot of times we don't get to invite, and I'm perfectly fine with that. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, that's true. I'm not talking about y'all in here. I'm talking about our own family. You know, when I'm talking about my own family, I'm talking about like you know people. I ain't even going to go and saying who. It's not my brother, so you don't worry about that. <laughs> like his own family. <laughs> People say, that's his brother he's talking about. No. But what I'm saying is because there's not going to be that compromise in life. So what will happen is people avoid coming to me if something's going on. 
So what they'll start trying to do is befriend somebody that they, they can see they can get one over on. You see what I'm saying? So they'll start going to that person where they're going to allow that compromise. They're going to start going to that person where they allow that. Hey, brother, I want to talk to you. You know, I come try to talk to Kevin. Kevin just don't understand. You know, he gets a little bit, oh, so you're already working. Why? Put up their 14. Craftiness whereby they lie, wait to deceive. So you don't want to come to me because we've been there a couple times and you didn't get what you want. You didn't get the pat on the back. You got the truth spoken in love, and you didn't call it love because you didn't like what you heard. So what do we do? We start looking at somebody, craftiness, cunningness, decept deceitfulness, and we start looking at somebody that if I befriend this person, well, maybe, and we may not even know this in my mind, but maybe what I can start doing, if I can befriend Chris, Chris is going to be my friend, and he's not going to be as strong. He's not going to be as hard as Kevin. He's going to give my flesh that little bit of room to get what it wants. And that's what we saw. And see, but the reason, the only reason that they're friends with you is because they are getting from you what they want. They're using you. What I say last week, every parasite needs a host. Or a couple weeks ago. Remember that? I've been talking about this for a while. Like a guy come up, that guy, people come up to me, they just have a, hey, brother, I want you to pray for me. Well, what do you want me to pray for? Whatever the Lord tells you. <laughs> Lord told me to tell you, you get to church tomorrow. <laughs> well, I ain't willing to do that. Well, then you ain't willing to get see what the Lord has for you. Amen? Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Whatever, we only pray, whatever the Lord gives you. Yeah. I'm going to go over here and talk to this person. Why? Because the Lord didn't give me nothing. <laughs> That's it. Amen. No, let's go on here. But speaking the truth in love may grow into him all things, following his word, following his ways, following his example, which is the head, even Christ. Now check this out, Jude one sixteen. Let me tell you what Jude one sixteen says. These people are habitual. Listen, now listen, I want to identify. Listen to me. If you got these people in your life, you need to remove them. Either that or start speaking the truth to them. Because if, if they're coming around you and they're habitually murmuring, complaining, belly aching, and whining, and they're doing you're part of the problem. You're part of the problem. If they feel like they can just come to you and comp just complain and murmur and, and all that stuff and they feel comfortable coming to you, people don't feel comfortable coming to me like that. So guess what they're going to do? They're going to find somebody they do. See, here's the problem. I can understand you got a problem. I can understand you got an issue. I can understand that. But if day to day to day that, you're, that, that the only thing you're doing is murmuring and complaining about the issue and you've not come with a solution, then don't tell me you're looking for a solution. You're part of the problem. It's like I used to tell my daughter, Bethany and Bailey, they'd come when they'd come tell me about all this drama. I'd say, how do you know about all this drama that's going on in school? And I, I said, the only way you can know all that, you've got to be involved in it. No, I'm not, Daddy. Yes, you are. No, I'm not. You are. You could not know what's going on if you're not involved. Right? So when we look at this, it's the book of Jude. Right? Jude. And he says, in Jude, it says, these people are habitual mur murmur. These people, and I'm reading this out of the uh, Amplified because I love the way it said it. These people are habitual murmurers, griping and complaining, following after their own desires, controlled by passion. They speak arrogantly, which means pretending admiration, flattering people to gain their own advantage. Let me read it to you. 
It says these people, all right, talking about people, talking about these people that are sowing lies, that are, that are sowing discord, that are not speaking the truth of the gospel, willing not to minister the truth. These people, all right, murmurers, people that are murmuring, griping, and complaining, is that you or do you know people like that? Because I guarantee you if you would quit giving an ear to it, you would know a lot less of them and your life would be a lot better. So some of us, our Christianity stopped right there. I ain't going to murmur or complain, but I do like some juicy gossip about somebody. Amen? I ain't going to say nothing, but I sure am going to listen so I can pray the proper way. All right? These people, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, got griping and complaining follow after their own desires. Listen, what I say, I go back to it again. Many people are not going to be friends with anybody unless they can see the benefit for them. See that? You know why they're murmuring, they're complaining to you? Because they're following after their own desire. And sooner or later, it's going to come into where it's going to get you to compromise somewhere to benefit them. You see that? You see that? That somewhere, the reason they're coming to you, the re see, the reason they're coming to, to going around Ronnie and coming to Brett is because somewhere they see that they can get one over on Brett that they couldn't get on Ronnie. Yeah. You see that? So they're going to come here, and they're going to gripe, and they're going to murmur, and they're going to complain to Brett, and then they're going to start talking bad about Ronnie because Ronnie holds them accountable. The Bible describes these people, yet we can't see when it's us. And what is the purpose of that, Ronnie? Because if that, purpose, if that person was truly looking to get set free, he'd come to you because he'd know he'd get the truth and love, but he's trying to hold on to his own desires instead of being truly set free from the thing that he wants, says he wants to be. He don't want freedom from it. If I'm skirting around it and going about it and murmuring and complaining and belly aching and skirting around and going, I don't want freedom from the thing I'm wanting. I'm just wanting to find somebody that will continue allowing me to do what I want to do incognito without anybody else seeing it. So what do I do? I become a predator and I can start picking out those people that I can do that with. Church is full of it. Be aware. Amen? Does that make sense to everybody? Amen. All right, let's go. These people murmuring, griping, complaining, following after their own desires, they speak arrogantly. In other words, pretending admiration. Pretending like they love the Lord. Pretending like they love old Ronnie. Well, Brad, I tell you what, I love old Ronnie. Ronnie sure is a good one. I tell you what, he's strong, but I just ain't as strong as he is. He just don't understand. I just don't want him to get on me and start telling me, you know, because he comes across a little bit rough. And so it, oh, and so it finds this person, and then this person starts giving compromise. And by that time, this person realizes what he's doing. He don't realize this person over here has already got him roped in. And the moment that compromise stops, that relationship ends. Because it's only what can benefit. That makes sense? Amen. All right, let's go on here. Flattering people to gain the advantage. Check this out. Imagine you, you go to a doctor, right? Doctor goes in there, you go in there, you get checked out. Brother Chris, been right through this. I almost didn't really use this example today because of Brother Chris, but I'm going to use it. Brother Chris been right through this. Go to the doctor. Doctor tells you you got cancer. That's a pretty bad report, isn't it? It's a bad report, Brother Chris. Gracie, they've been through it. They know. We don't know what that, I don't know what that feel like. I know Jenny would, Brother Chris would, Gracie would, other people. But I've never had one of my loved ones come home and say, hey, I've been diagnosed with cancer. So I can't imagine what the, you know, I don't I can't imagine. And then imagine that person. Let's say it's Sharon, Rick. Sharon gets mad at the doctor because the doctor just ruined her day. I can't believe I went to that doctor today. I know I had a little bit going on. I know I wasn't feeling real good. But that doctor just sat right there, looked at me right in the eyes, didn't have no bedside manner, and just looked at me. Can you believe the way he said it? He just said, you got cancer. 
I mean, he didn't, try to, he didn't try to buy me a cup of coffee. He didn't try to soften it up. He didn't try to do anything like that. He just said, you got cancer. And you get mad at him because of that. But the worst thing is this, that if he wouldn't have told you you got cancer, because he, he took a vow as a doctor to protect, to provide, to care for people, to tell people. And the worst thing to do instead of worried about whether you was going to be mad or not was to tell you you didn't have cancer and let you go on down the road. He would have been immoral, unethical, and his license could have been revoked. And we got too many preachers that are standing behind a pulpit today that are being immoral, unethical. Their license ought to be revoked because they're not willing to say what needs to be said. And we got too many people calling themselves Christians that are doing the same thing. And we got too many people that cloud themselves pretending to be something that they're not. And many, many times, the Word of God becomes an excellent tool to manipulate somebody into thinking that you're something that you're not. Amen? All right, let's go on here. Let's go down to James 2. We're going to start finishing up here. James 2. What does it profit a man, or what does it profit my brethren, though a man say he has faith and have not works? Can faith save him? We've all heard this. Huh? The evidence of faith is living out what we believe. Listen. Faith without works is dead, and works without faith is dead. Faith without works is dead, and works without faith is dead. Faith and works got to go together in order for it to do what it needs to do. Does that make sense? All right? So let's go on here. What does it profit, my brother, and though a man say he has faith and have not works? The evident, and I'm going to read through this quick just for time's sake because I got my notes, you know, scripts uh, tied through here. The evidence of faith is the living out what we believe. Many people there are saved, but the evidence doesn't show that. Matter of fact, many people that, most people that say that they believe, when you look at the evidence of their life, it points toward unbelief. Anybody ever thought about that? You look at the evidence of their life. I believe I'm born again. I'm saved. Why? Well, because I got baptized. Cause I believe in Jesus. Yeah, but I, what's the evidence? Well, God forgives me. Okay, God forgives. That's what he does. But part of being a Christian is you should be willing to repent. Where's the repentance? All right. So we got many people that, are, that say they're born again and saved, but the evidence points more toward not being saved than toward being saved. The evidence in their life. Does that make sense? And I can expound on that, but I'm not going to. Can faith, he says, what does it profit, my brother, though a man say he have faith and have not works? Can faith, that means the kind of faith that has no evidence. Now listen to this. Can faith save him? He's asking a question. He's saying, what does it profit, my brother, though a man say he has faith and have not works? He's saying, you just saying you love Jesus and you believe in Jesus, can that and that alone save you? Listen to me, church. If Sodom would have got a message like this, they would have repented and they'd still be here today. He says, you say that you believe. The church, the body of Christ is full of it. You say that you believe. And James is saying, you just saying that you believe. Is that enough to save you? Where do we get this stuff that I can walk away from God, live however I want to live, and then I'm saved? Please tell me where that comes from. You know where that comes from? Looking for teachers, you're tossed to and fro, you're up and down, looking for people you are willing to be deceived and you will hunt for the preacher that will tell you find the one that deceives you. You will look for him until you find him. Can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute, in other words, not adequate, not enough. And listen, so what, here's what we're flipping over. You giving somebody a pair of clothes is not what saves you either. 
You, you going and doing work at the food pantry ain't what saves you either. Me standing up here preaching this gospel ain't what saves me. You going to church ain't what saves you. Amen. So this is what he's saying. He said, in other words, if a man just says he believes, can, can, can faith alone save him? He says, if a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, depart in peace, not helping him out at all, be ye warmed and filled, and you give them not the things which are needful to the body, what does it profit? So he's saying in the same way, can, in other words, he's saying, if you have faith, and don't have obedience to follow it, can that faith alone save you in the same way that if somebody is naked and hungry and you don't give them any food, in the same way you didn't give them any food, that didn't help them, and in the same way you don't have obedience, that don't help you. That's what he's saying there. It don't mean that if you say you have faith and you live in disobedience to God, that if you go give somebody a sandwich, that saved you. That's not what it means. That's not your works. He's saying in the same way that if you truly want to help somebody, instead of you saying, I'll pray for you, there ought to be works to go with that desire to help. And if you truly say you're saved, there ought to be some works to go with it. Obedience to the Word of God. Does that make sense? Even so, faith, if it has not works, is dead being alone. Listen at He says, faith by itself alone is dead. Read that. Read that. Even so, faith, and this is what people call faith. I believe in Jesus. I believe in Jesus. But I'm drinking, I'm drugging, I'm lying, I'm whatever it is. But they say, I believe in Jesus. Even so, faith, if it don't have works, is dead being alone. You must. Faith by itself don't work, and works by itself don't work. It must be faith and works mixed together before it counts. This is going to blow people's minds out there. Some people are not going to let the Bible get in the way of what they believe. Even so, faith, we got one part. If it has not works, we got two parts. Is dead. Being alone. There's going to be people that are going to church. There are going to be people that are confessing all the right things, but you're going to bust the gates of hell right open. And you know what the sad thing is? You ain't even going to know it until you hear this. Apart from me, for I never knew you, you worker of iniquity. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith. In other words, claiming to have faith. I say, I got works. Show me thy faith without works. Faith cannot be shown without corresponding actions. Just like wanting to help the person that needed food could not be shown without actually giving her food. It's pretty simple. You got to be taught to screw this up. And you got, I mean, you got to, you got to, you got to allow yourself willingly to be deceived to this. I know people studied Bible for years and would argue this with me. Because when your will is not broken, your will will always find a way to get around God's will. It says, if I have works, show me thy faith without works, and I will show thee my faith with works. He says, all right, you say you got faith, show it to me without your works. All right? And, if, and I say, you know, works, if you, you can't have works 
without faith, and you can't have faith without works. So he says right here, he's asking him, he's saying, he's saying, I got works. He's saying, he said, man, say thou hast faith, and I have works. He's saying, hey, you say you got faith, but I got works. Ooh. I had, you know, I literally had a guy to tell me one time that the book of James needs to be ripped out of the Bible. I literally, I mean, had a deacon in a church. And when he said that, I rebuked him. I was like, ah! The book of James is the simplest of the gospel of all the epistles, I believe. And he says, so he says, I have works. This person is not outwardly saying he has faith, but is doing good because of his faith. Show me thy faith without works. Faith can't be shown without corresponding actions, obedience to God's word. And I will show thee my faith by works. Let's go on here. I'm going to go through this quick. Thou believest that there is one God. Now check this out. Thou doest well. The devils believe and tremble. Listen, he's saying your faith ain't no different than the demons. So who's got more faith, you or devils? So let's just break this down. You believe that there is one God. Okay. You do well. Good job. Good. Your faith is about the same level as the demons. You believe that there is one God? You do well. The devils also believe and tremble. So he's saying, listen, you can, you can say you got faith all day long. But let's break this down. The devils believe. Demons believe in God. I mean, we read the story when the old legion come running over there and had to bow down before the Lord. They called him Lord right there, did he not? I mean, how many times we see when Jesus shows up, they call him Lord. Right? So the devils believe in God, but they don't obey God. They don't try to clean up their language. They don't try to clean up their attitudes. They belly ache, they whine, they complain, they murmur. They don't want the truth of the Word of God. They don't want none of that. So what he's saying, he's saying, listen, if you say you have faith and you have no obedience, then you ain't no different than the demons, the devils. You got the same. Matter of fact, they probably got more faith than you. Wow. They tremble. They tremble at the name of you. We sat there drinking, you know, Smoking a joint in one hand, drinking whiskey out the other hand, popping pills in her mouth all at the same time. Yeah, I'm a believer. Ain't no fear. Not, even the demons fear God, but man does not. The demons will tremble at the mention of the name of Jesus. But only man will willingly live in his sin while proclaiming the name of Jesus. Kevin, your words are always so hard. I just wish one weekend we'd walk out of here feeling edified. I do feel edified when I get out of here. I don't want a message that ain't going to cost me to examine myself. No, what we want is a message that lies to us many times. Amen? Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well, but devils, they believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that means foolish, you old foolish thing. That's what he's saying. You foolish thing. Don't thou know, O vain man, he's calling these people foolish for thinking this way. That faith without works is dead. He said, don't you know this? Surely you ain't so foolish that you don't know this. Was not Abraham our father justified by works? His obedience to what God told him to do, what God told him to do. He said, get on up out of, get out, get out of your land, get away from your family, go on. Oh, yeah, and by the way, kill that boy. His faith was justified by works. Because if he wouldn't have left in the first place, got out of the land, he would have never been in a position to do what he done. All right? We go on here. 
Uh, but will thou, vain man, says, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac, his son, upon the altar? What if, what if, what if when God told him, he said, here's what I want you to do. I'll, now, just, let's, just, let's just compare this, okay? Let's just compare this. What if God would have said, hey, uh, Abe, here's what I want you to do, Abraham. You believe me? Yes, sir, I do. You do whatever I ask you to do? Yep, sure will. I want you to kill that boy. Ho, 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 ho. No. Can't do that. Hold on. You say you believe me? Yeah. I want you to get out of that relationship. Hold on. You say you believe me? I want you to address this and speak it in truth. Hold on, Lord. You say you believe me? I want you to lay down the pipe. I want you to lay down the booze. I want you to lay down the alcohol. Quit, quit the gossiping. Quit the murmuring. Quit the complaining. Quit listening to those that do it. You say you believe me? See, the Bible says that Abraham was justified by his works. In other words, when he actually carried out what God told him to do. Y'all with me? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac? Would he have been obedient if he wouldn't have offered Isaac up? Nope. See thou, see thou how faith wrought with its works. See how faith, see, he's saying, now don't you see how faith and works works together? And by works was faith made perfect. So you can't have faith without works and you don't have works without faith. They go together. It's not complete unless you got those two corresponding. Now, you can have works, but if you don't have faith in Christ, then those works don't save you. That make, let me say it that way. I mean, a lot of people do a lot of good works, but they don't believe in Jesus Christ, and they're still going to the same hell as anybody else. Amen. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. All right. And the Scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, as he was called the friend of God. You see then. How that by works, it's going to blow your mind. A man is justified and not by faith only. So the first thing people love to do is here is we go back, well, Paul said this. We're justified by faith. We are. And you got the works that go with faith because when you take, don't take just that little scripture that says justified by faith and read it when you actually read everything before it and after it too. Isn't it amazing how we'd love to take that and do away with it? Amen? All right. So it says, you see, that not by works a man is justified. See, so James preaches that works will correspond with your faith. And Paul preaches that faith will cause your works. You see the difference there? So Paul, so James is preaching your works identify your faith. Paul preaches it this way. Faith will change your works. Which is what? The same what? Message. Same message. Because you can't have one without the other. Does that make sense? You can't have one without the other. All right? Likewise, also was not Rehab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messenger and had sent them out the other way? For as the body without the... Listen to this. Listen to this. Here it is again. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. <laughs> so there's all these people running around that think they got faith in Jesus Christ, but it's dead. It's dead. It's not there. It's dead. Dead faith. No life in it. Dead faith. So we see all these people running around, living however they want to live. Oh, I believe, I believe. Not being obedient to God, not following God's word, and they think they got faith. And the Bible says right here, no, you don't. For as the body without the spirit is dead, if, if my spirit leaves my body, it will fall on the ground dead. It will not have the ability to move nor to work. So is faith without works dead. And 
And this is why people say, Kevin preaches law. First Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable. I've been preaching the same message for, since 2008. I've seen people come. I've seen people go. I've seen ministries rise. I've seen ministries fall. I've seen churches open. I've seen churches close. Some of the closest people that I used to run with. I've been kicked out of relationships. I've been kicked out of churches. I've had people tell me, no, I don't want nothing to do with you. I've seen many of those people fall back into drugs, fall back into alcohol, turn their back on God, turn their back on the ministry, turn their back on Jesus. Then I've seen them come back around. Then I've seen them leave again. I've seen them circle back around. We, not, we may not be a 500-member church. We may not even be a 250-member church like we once was, but the message don't change. The people may change. The congregation may change, but the message don't. The message don't. Amen? Being continually aware that your labor in the Lord is not futile nor wasted. That's what I'm aware of. Amen? to stand up.